This video is going to show you how to do a within subjects ANOVA in JASP. The design today is just a simple within subjects ANOVA in which we've got a single independent variable which has three levels in this example. But of course this example would work if you had four, five or six levels to your ANOVA. So in the example we're going to look at what we had, we had an experiment in which we had 100 students who all sat a statistics exam under three experimental conditions. So everybody did this statistics exam three times and the three different conditions were listening to three different albums by Captain Beefheart. Um, this is Captain Beefheart and his magic band here. So you can imagine this is going to be a bit weird. Um, so the first example um, album that they listened to was Safe as Milk. Safe as Milk is um, quite an easy album to listen to um, when it comes to Captain B Fast. Um, so they would have sat there through this entire exam, they get a score out of 100 while they're listening to a nice song like I'm Glad. Um, the next condition is Trout Mask Replica. So they had to listen to this while completing this exam. Um, as you can probably imagine, it's quite hard to concentrate while listening to this. It doesn't get any better, just to skip along. And in the final condition, they listen to the album Strictly Personal, um, which is sort of midway between the two. Bit weird, but certainly not as bad as the greatest troll mask replica. So, these are different conditions, and we want to see how listening to these different Captain B Fart albums influenced people's exam performance. So, in order to do this, we go to ANOVA and Repeated Measures ANOVA. So, this gives us our Repeated Measures window. Now you can see we've got repeated measures factor 1, repeated measures factor 2 mentioned here, and so on. So we've only got one factor, we've only got one independent variable. If we had a complex design, we can just simply add repeated measures factors by clicking on this, and this will open up some more levels to add, but we won't go into that today. So we've got repeated measures factors 1, and then we've got our levels. We can actually label this if we want, call this album for example. And then we can actually label our levels to it as well. I won't write them all out in full. Let's just call it Safe as Milk for that one. Trout Mask Replica. And Strictly Personal. And then you'll see this produces our repeated measures cells appear below. If you make a mistake and you add one you don't want, you can delete. You've always got to have at least two, because if you don't have at least two, it's not really an independent variable at all. There's no conditions at all, so you're always going to have at least two. So if you made a mistake, you can just delete that. You can always edit the names as you go along. So all you need to do now is tell JASP which of the columns in your data set relate to your repeated measures of cells. And it's always best to put these in the same order, saves you a bit of time and you can click these across so now JASP knows what your experimental design is and because it's JASP it automatically computes everything in the window alongside it you'll know it's got between subjects factors here this is if you want to do a mixed ANOVA and you can also have covariates in it but we'll leave that today so as you can see it automatically is computing your repeated measures ANOVA giving you degrees of freedom, your F statistic and your P value there's a few things we should really do. The first is check your sphericity. Um, it produces Muckley's value here. And we want Muckley's to be non-significant. If it's non-significant, then we've met the assumptions of sphericity in our data. If you only have a two level IV, it's worth noting that that is always assumed. You can't have a violation of that assumption if you only have a two level IV because it's about differences between differences in variances. So we've met this assumption a bit later on in the video. Um, 
you can jump across to the time and noted here I'll show you what you can do and how you can deal with it if you violate this assumption but well, because it's Jasper it's a relatively simple process to do and you don't have to view all these statistics automatically like you're doing things like SPSS so as you can see we've got a statistically significant main effect of album on exam performance of course we should always go for our additional options and get estimates of effect size so we get eta squared as default. Due to this experimental design, you'll see that perhaps eta squared gives exactly the same thing. So we'll just report an eta squared here. So this is just approximately the amount, proportion of variance that the IV predicts in our DV. So we can just write up these statistics accordingly, taking our F statistic, our degrees of freedom, our P value and our eta squared and state something along the lines of there was a significant effect of album on exam performance and then we report our statistics accordingly. Of course what we don't know from this is we've got really no idea which condition people perform better in. Maybe listening to really discordant music on Trout Mask Replica can really focus people's mind. It's, we don't know just from this alone. This just says an effect and our data exists somewhere and we need to look at this in a bit more detail. Well, the first thing we can do is I'll certainly give us some ideas to start with our descriptive statistics. So we get a mean and a standard deviation for each of our conditions. As you can see, safe as milk has the highest mean, trial mask replica the lowest mean, and strictly personal falls somewhere in the middle. So we can ask for our postdoc tests to do these comparisons. So we just need to tell it we're doing postdoc tests for albums. We can also ask for our effect size as well, so we can get Cohen's D statistic, which is always good to report. It's good that JASP does this, unlike SPSS, which won't give you these effect sizes. It says here, pull error term for repeated measures factors. Um, I can't really see why you'd want to do this particularly, so you can just leave that blank. Now we've also got the p-values we can ask for, so what type of correction do we want on the p-value? So does a Bonferroni, um, a Holm, for this, this design, um, we will go into this in any detail, but as you can see, it's not going to produce you a 2 kilo a chef for post hoc test. Um, so we can make a decision which one we want. Um, this example will ask for home. Um, so what's this telling us? Well, as you can see, safe as milk compared to trout mass replica. It's a positive mean difference. So this is just the differences between, this is when you subtract trout mass replica scores from the SAM scores, safe as milk scores you get a mean difference of 4.49. You can just, you, you, you know, these, this is gonna be that difference from just looking at our descriptive statistics, really. We've got a highly statistically significant difference between the two, p-value of less than 0 0.001, and we've got decent effect size, we've got current D of 0.72. If you compare safe as milk to strictly personal, we have got a statistically significant results, but it's only really marginal, and the effect size is relatively small as well. Um, and if we compare trial mask replica to strictly personal, we see a highly statistically significant difference between the two. So this comes out as a minus, and that's simply because we're now subtracting these scores from trial mask replica. So they are the lowest scores in the exam. So if you subtract the strictly personal scores, of course you get a minus figure. What really matters though is you know the p value for the difference and the effect size that we derive for it as well. And personally, I don't think we really need to report that that's a minus effect size. And the, the direction of the difference doesn't really matter, provided you write things up clearly. So, for example, if you were to write all these statistics up, we could just write postdoc comparisons, reveal that this was due to significantly better exam performance, listening to safe as milk. And we could also report our mean, mark, and standard deviation compared to trout mask replica. And we can give a p value and our current D and also compared to strictly personal, give our descriptive statistics, our p-value, our cones d for that as well. And then we can also state that performance was also better following strictly personal compared to trial mask replica, give our p-value and our cones d. So because I've made it very clear that performance is better following strictly personal compared to trial mask replica, um, you don't need to put these minuses in. And these minuses only make sense really within the context of the order you put these things into your ANOVA um, so 
they're essentially quite meaningless. You just make things clear which condition had the highest scores. So there's a few other things that we could do as well. We could also get our descriptive plots. So you can get our descriptive plot and we just ask for album along the horizontal axis. Scroll down. So you can see this is safe as milk, trying to last for record, kind of strictly personal, let's just plot it our means. We always want to have our error bars as well, 95% confidence intervals. Then you can see the pattern results quite neatly here. So if you're really confused by these tables, some people can be, then well this is going to show you pretty much what's going on in our data quite clearly here. So we can clearly see that the highest scores are safe as milk, really low scores after trap mass replica, and mediocre middle scores for strictly personal. This is exactly the same experiment, but this time let's mess with the data um, to ensure that it doesn't meet the assumption of sphericity. So to do this, we just set the experiment up in exactly the same way as we did before. So let's quickly fill these all in. So we get our anode repairs. But you'll see, even without asking for assumption checks, what you can see is, it actually gives you a warning here. The Muckley's test of sphericity indicates that the assumption of sphericity is violated and the p-value is less than 0 0.05. So, telling you you've got an issue with the data. So you know you've got a problem. If we go, and we can actually get our Muckley's test, as you can see, we've got a highly significant p-value here, so we've got a problem with this data. Um, and the nice thing is that we can tick and we can get our corrections and so we've got none, the greenhouse geyser and the way felt measure. So you need to make action, you need to make a decision about which one of these to report, you'll never report all of these statistics. The way you can do that is you look at, look at these epsilon values here. And essentially if, the, if your epsilon is greater than 0.75 then you'd be reporting the Hawaii felt statistic. So you can see the Hawaii felt statistic and the epsilon is above 0.75 so that's the statistic we should be reporting so to simplify matters you may just want to get rid of all those and you now have just the way you felt it's um, a correction on the degrees of freedom and um, it doesn't you'll notice your statistic doesn't change at all in this example it doesn't actually change your p-value at all either but now we could write this data up accordingly of course we'd also want to get our additional options and get our estimates of effect size as well. So we could you know, tell the reader that um, data violated the assumption of sphericity and give our p-value for that as well. And that, therefore we can then we can tell them that therefore degrees of freedom are correctly using the way felt estimates of sphericity and report our epsilon alongside that and then simply there's a significant main effect of album on exam performance. And then we'd give our what look to be, I suppose, what you used to be seeing slightly unusual degrees of freedom due to the fact that they're corrected ones. With regards to postdoc tests, there's actually um, no sort of specific postdoc test that we'd be doing for this. You see, we don't have a different version of a postdoc test for when we don't have sphericity. And um, so we just report our postdoc test to like before we give our whole correction. The only sort of non parametric postdoc test that we actually have is if we were to do it as a Friedman's test and that's for Conover's postdoc test there, so that's your non-parametric test and then it gives you Bonferroni and Holm corrected p-values for that as well. It's actually already a video um, on the YouTube channel that shows you all about doing Friedman's tests so if you'd like to look at that, that's available for you there. And there's one thing just to mention as well um, Muckley's W to directly derive a p value. That p value um, is actually derived from a chi squared statistic, so that, that would need to be converted to a chi squared. I don't actually know the formula which is used by JASP to do this, but then this will APA format actually does state that you should be given a chi squared statistic alongside this, and maybe in the future it'd be a useful feature for it to have in JASP. But saying that it's, um, it's very rare that you'll actually see anyone report the the chi squared statistic alongside the um, p value for this. Often you'll just see Muckley's W and a p value reported with it.